Kalange, uh huh? Kalange from the Colorado Trust, talking about the EGAP program. Yeah, I'm really, uh, really pleased and, and uh, honored to be here. I get to rooms like this, and I'm always reminded that <laughs> I'm not a geneticist, and Moeen Corey can't make me one. I'm just a simple country clinical epidemiologist, uh, kind of turned philanthropist. Uh, but I've been working with EGAP since its inception and uh, wanted to talk a little bit about <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. Listening to this, uh, the discussions this morning, I, w I was reminded about talks I give to medical students and others about evidence-based medicine. And I have this slide that you know I worked on with David Eddy that said, says something like, promising, innovative, new, cutting edge, none of those are synonyms for effective. And now I'm going to add to that, actionable. <laughs> I, I looked up the definition of actionable and it says information on which you can make a decision. It doesn't say the decision's right or works, it just says you can make a decision. So I want to move down the spectrum a little bit to, uh, to uh, unanswered questions. So in 2004, uh, Muin Curry and others were asking these questions about genetics. How valid and reliable is the information? What are the benefits and harms associated with actually using these in clinical practice? And what action should we take on the, based on the results? Then what should our response be for the medical community, public health, policymakers, et cetera? And then here's a slide that Muin used, I think, just last week or two weeks ago that really kind of says the same issues, although there's a lot more articles now and, and people saying things like, we need to quit, this is Jim Evans, pushing genetics into medicine and um, talking about the evidence dilemma and waiting for the revolution. So <laughs> I think that we're still facing a lot of the same issues. So I want to talk about EGAP, Evaluating Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention. This is a CDC project um, that actually has a steering committee made up of other national partners. Uh, it's non-regulatory. I always like to say it's independent, non-federal, multidisciplinary working group. Not that anyone ever notices the word independent, because the USPS, TF, the Preventive Services Task Force, is independent and yet is, is also known as the secret government death panel. So we're not a secret government death panel. We're just a bunch of people trying to uh, make some sense out of issues. We integrate existing processes for education and appraisal. We minimize conflicts of interest. And we want to be evidence-based, transparent, and publicly accountable. And you can find the work that we've managed to do on egapreviews.org. So, how did we put this together? So we wanted to integrate knowledge and experience, so we took genetic uh, assessment framework from the ACE framework, and then developed strategies to look at quality of studies. And this was a little hard for the analytic validity area, uh, but we took it on and, and, uh, and uh, borrowed information from the USPSTF. We also borrowed systematic evidence review strategies from AHRQ's evidence-based practice center. So we incorporated things that people already did we also have, I, I, I wouldn't say that EGAP pioneered, but we helped and used new modeling strategies to uh, address different evidence gaps, specific, specifically in the area of GWAS and, and the, the, the unique problem of small relative risks. And then uh, we developed clinical recommendations with hopefully clear uh, linkage to the evidence. There's a process that we put together, and, and this is it, and we try to be transparent with it. So we select a topic, we define the clinical scenario, and this is important because this meeting, uh, I think, it, is vital because the clinical scenario that we framed our work in has changed. So our clinical scenario has always been, should you order the test and use it to guide therapy to gain an important health outcome? And now the question is, the test has already been done, right? What are you going to do with the results? So <clears throat> we're trying to adapt uh, uh, with the changes, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the very end. So then we evaluate the quality, synthesize the literature, determine this issue of the balance of benefits and harms, and make a recommendation. <clears throat> 
Um, I can't uh, do this talk without showing an analytic framework. I have to apologize, but it's, it's how we think about the work. And it starts on the far end saying, well, we have, here we have adults with non-psychotic -psych, uh, depression, and you're thinking about therapy with SSRIs. Number one would be the overarching question, uh, basically is it a randomized controlled trial that shows this actually improves health outcomes. Given that we rarely get that, uh, we put together this chain of evidence and ask questions about uh, number two is, well, does the test actually measure what it's supposed to measure? And questions number three is, is what it's measuring actually clinically valid? Is it related to something that might be important? And then number four and five get you to the issue of, does it show clinical utility? Or in the vernacular of where the money is today, is there a patient-centered outcome somewhere down the line? Questions in the analytic framework we already talked about. So analytic validity, is the test right? Clinical validity, do they translate to something? And that includes like, uh, all of the issues of pos clinical positive and negative predictive values, um, sensitivity, specificity, penetrance, all of those are wrapped into clinical validity. And then finally, utility, does this translate to some important health outcome somewhere down the line, and are the outcomes uh, benefits ba better than the harms? I have to add this last issue because I've drank in the CER Kool-Aid. So this is the next question that <coughs> you should ask, and as I was thinking about the CVD risk factors, this is where the money is, right? Does the availability and use of this information improve health outcomes instead of net benefit when compared to usual care? Somebody already said it. We're actually pretty good at this. Not great, but pretty good. And <coughs> what's the marginal benefit? And then once I've identified that, and let's just assume there is marginal benefit to all the things we've been talking about, what, what is that at the expense of? Now, as the cost of whole genome sequencing comes down, it's not a monetary cost. It's really the cost of the workups, the diagnoses, the treatments that may or may not be needed, and then the harms associated with those. So we have completed some recommendations. I love the pretest. Whoever put it together included at least three <laughs> items that we've already made recommendations on. One is the SSRI issues, where the recommendation is that the evidence is insufficient. Um, for or against CYP450 testing to inform SSRI study and use is discouraged. So we actually said it's insufficient and we're not certain you should do it until you actually know the answer. And this was interesting because the issue of clinical validity, which was what we've been talking a lot about here, was the, was the place where the hole was, right? So, so you can identify where the gaps of evidence are. Here's another one in the list, insufficient to recommend for or against UG uh, one a, T1A1, I, I don't have all the letters in there, in, uh, in CRC patients to be treated with a reno TCAN. So <laughs> this was an interesting one because the clinical validity is there, but the clinical utility is almost set on its head. It was almost like, yeah, you should run a higher risk of uh, severe adverse reactions because you actually get a better response rate. And so because we couldn't actually develop the clinical scenario to make a confident uh, recommendation, we left it in the insufficient area, but it doesn't mean there isn't promise coming. And then finally, evidence is recommend to, I'm uh, sorry, is adequate to recommend against routine testing for factor V Leiden uh, in adults with uh, idiopathic VTEs. And in fact, the evidence showed that long-term um, uh, anticoagulation benefited people almost equally, right? Whether or not you had the, the variant or not. And then back to CVD, evidence is insufficient to recommend testing for the 9PT1, sorry, 9P21 genetic variant or 57 other variants in 28 genes to assess risk for cardiovascular disease in the general population. And it's this issue that you just can't improve the receiver operator curve in predicting outcome very much with these very small relative risks associated with these SNPs. So those are kind of the issues that you all answered if you actually answered the pretest or the pre-work, uh, you answered questions on. So let me just uh, kind of end with translating where this comes because um, it feels a little as if we, we've, uh, we've been standing on the sideline watching your research and, and, and the horses left the barn. You know, we, we've been at this since 2005 
Uh, I think we put out our first recommendation in 2009. And if you summarize it, we're doing about one gene test a year. We will never catch up. Okay. okay. So you're, you're a little bit ahead of us there. So, <coughs> but is there some relevance? So I'm going to tell you that, you know, in my heart of hearts, we continue to have relevance from the standpoint of, you know, finally when we put these into clinical practice and we use them and we recommend them, we should have good evidence. So that would be tier one according to uh, Dr. Khoury. Tier two would be, well, you know, we have clinical validity. So it's promising. It is actually associated with disease. It's actionable. So we ought to think about how to handle those differently. And then tier three, discourage use. The other way to put it in is to, in, to this is uh, uh, Jonathan who's going to speak this afternoon, and uh, Jim Evans, and Muin, would, or, or they're all on this project. This is saying, well, let's talk about bins, bin uh, one, two, and three. And the methods actually can translate directly to that. So if there's poor evidence for analytic validity, you guys, you, the laboratorians in the room, just fix that, would you? Okay, just get that next genome sequencing working so I don't have to worry about analytic validity because I don't like to talk about it. If you don't have good evidence for clinical utility, I forgot to go away. You should never hand me a tool. Um, let me go this way. There we go. Poor uh, evidence for clinical validity. This has been three, or uh, Muin, it's your tier three, right? It's, uh, let's put them off for now. We need more research. Don't use them clinically. If we move on down, we have clinical validity, but we don't know if it provides clinical utility. This has been two or tier two, okay? We need more research. It doesn't mean don't do it. There's promise here. This is the promise of personalized medicine. And then if you have evidence for clinical validity, if it's positive, let's figure out how to translate it into practice. And if it's negative, let's figure out how to not do it. So. Um, the kind of practicality in binning is that uh, it's expensive and time consuming to do clinical utility. We have to worry about clinical validity and you heard a little about that in the edges that because we're looking at numerators most of the time, we don't have good cohort control groups, there's biases that can be introduced. And, um, but, but on the other hand, looking at clinical validity is relatively easy. So we should be able to say, boy, if you don't have at least clinical validity, let's put you into bin three, let's say no early, and uh, we'll let the researchers in the room figure out whether or not those are useful. So I'll end there and see if I can answer some questions. Thanks, Ned. We have time now for comments or questions. Do any of those categories where you've decided that not, it's not actionable now, does any of that change when you've got the sequence already? Um, so is any of that a cost consideration that it's not worth, the cost of the test doesn't justify a small effect, but maybe if you've got it already, there's enough effect to justify using it? Yeah, I think this is the, this is the crux of the conference, right? So we know there's an association. <clears throat> and as you think about it, that does make it actionable. And so the, then the question says, are there uh, additional costs or harms associated with that action? So, you know, one of our recommendations, which we take a little bit of grief for, okay, a lot of grief, is Oncotype DX and breast cancer. <clears throat> and the question, I mean, there's evidence for good clinical validity, but when you get to the utility issue, it actually looks good as well. But remember, you use it to not use a therapy. Right? So <clears throat> you can think about that a little bit. Is there a risk to not using the therapy? There are certainly benefits, right? So you don't expose women to the, this, uh, these chemotherapeutic agents that have adverse effects. But the, the benefits, the clinical benefits, while small, are not zero. So there are some harms, albeit small, associated with the use of that test. <clears throat> so I just want, uh, I want to, Always bring up that actionable actions have two sides, right? And we have, to be, we have to be disciplined to make sure we're considering not just the economic costs, which I think I'm content now are going to be minimized. 
but the downstream of cost, uh, effects of the test itself. Um, Ned, I mean, one of the things that come up repeatedly in our conversations is about the definition of clinical utility and how that changes based on the like I have the whole you know who's talking about that and the piece of personal utility and I think that's going to be a big issue to try to wrestle with and come around, have consensus around is what does actionable really mean in a clinical context and how do we incorporate personal utility as well into that. Definition. I think it's a great question. I think yeah. Thanks for asking it. So um, the 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 issue to me is that you know when we're all in medical school, because I know you all heard this. I'm almost certain someone told you don't order a test unless the the results are going to change what you do. Well, I will tell you that bar has moved, and some of it has moved in the area of personal utility from the issue of wouldn't it be nice to know, right or yeah, I'd kind of like to know that. And there's not, a, there's not an in-depth understanding about what that phrase translates to. And I will tell you it translates differently in Canada, for example, than it does in the US, where they actually asked parents, this is fascinating, in Quebec, they said, if you couldn't do anything about it, would you want the results? And then the United States people say, well, of course I would want the results. And the people in Quebec said, no. Nah. So, so I think wrestling with this issue in our culture and, and our discipline of medicine is going to be real important, and it's not going to be an easy answer. I mean, once you have the genome, right, and, I don't know, the 3,000, no, 3 billion or 3,000 tests we can identify, <clears throat> you know, how much of it do you want to know? It, if I only learn about one variant I might have a day, it's going to take me a few years to get through my genome. Uh-oh. Sorry. Can I ask you, um, so the EGAP methodology is very rigorous. It, it, it's like a typical U.S. Preventive Services Task Force or a similar kind of methodology where you're really looking for very strong evidence. There's, I guess, discussion about whether that's the right metric for genetic genomics. Can you comment on sort of what your thoughts are on, on that topic? Right. So um, <clears throat> I try to think about what aspects of genetic testing should make it an exception. And one is that boy, it's happening so fast. <laughs> so I don't think, for me, that's not a good reason to use a different metric. Um, so then I say, well, do I believe that the potential downsides or the harms are somehow less? Um, and I think that's, a, that's an askable and answerable question to which there's not a rich database. So there are some times when we've looked at the, the negative side of information and didn't find significant harms. We didn't find, we didn't find no harm or anxiety or labeling or problems, but we found less. And I think <clears throat> once we, if we can actually think about the relative risks of premature uh, adoption versus late adoption based on evidence and look at those trade-offs and take them on head on, then I think we can better answer that question. If it's screening, right? and it's going to cause me to do something that could be harmful, then I can't think of a reason why we would apply a different metric. So screening is in asymptomatic, otherwise well people, which is what we all want to be. That's what I want to be, an AWOP, otherwise well asymptomatic person. Yeah, I think this gets back to the point that you were making that, you know, much as we were talking about how you apply screens to variants, you know, to determine uh, whether or not uh, you can really even begin to look at them from the perspective of biological um, uh, relevance. Given all of the information that we have, we have to develop some rapid screens to be able to say, we don't have to look at this whole bunch of them because we, we know based on these very simple criteria that we can apply that these just don't have enough evidence. So it makes no sense to apply a huge uh, expensive evidence review process is something that we know a priori is not going to have the evidence that we want. Uh, now there's going to have to be some nuance there because for rare or ultra rare diseases the evidence is different than for big common uh, conditions. And so I think this is one of the areas where uh, I know that EGAP has certainly thought about it but it hasn't necessarily um, 
uh, commented on uh, how they might apply that type of a sorting process to really get at uh, the ones that we need to focus our energies on. Well, uh, I think that's really great, Mark, and we're looking for new members, so I hope you have your application in. <clears throat> I think this is, if, if EGAP's going to be relevant going into the future, I think this is what we need to do. We need to embrace the issue that, that the th things have changed. The clinical scenario is different. Can we still provide some value uh, in a way that will actually keep us funded? Can we provide some value moving forward? I think it's a real, it, it's a real important issue. You also, as you're talking, reminded me, um, of something else, and it was a great thought, but now it's gone. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it's all right. My, must not, as my mom would have said, it must not have been that important. Um, that was really, really an excellent overview. And one thing that has struck me in hearing the various talks is I've, I've heard as many different um, definitions of evidence as the number of speakers today. Um, but I will say that the EGAP standards are, are much like, for example, the NHLBI is putting together the updated guidelines on prevention of hypertension, obesity, et cetera, not genetics, but those are the kinds of standards that EGAP and, are using. And so it represents one extreme, but um, I think one needs to consider that that's what's being used in clinical guidelines. So now you've reminded me, and I'm really thankful for that. So the issue is, so let me take two things. One is to quote uh, Jim Evans, who's uh, not, and hopefully I'm not stealing any of Jonathan's thunder, but uh, what's in bin three today could be in bin one tomorrow, right? We just don't know yet. So there are these, uh, there are a lot of variants of unknown significance. But to your issue, there's a big, I mean, we've been talking basically around bin two today, clinically actionable with, with or without strong evidence of clinical utility. I think if we could be smart and disciplined enough, I mean, I was trying to bring this forward. I, I just rotated off the advisory committee for newborn screening. If we could be disciplined enough to put it in the field and say we're going to do that thing that I, I think uh, it's, um, yeah, coverage, well, I was trying to think of who pioneered it. It was the folks in California. Coverage with evidence development. And be disciplined enough to say when we find out moving forward that it doesn't work, we're not going to do it anymore. That's the problem. If we could be disciplined, then I think Ben too is that area that's asking for that. Let's talk about conditional use, use in research settings, coverage with evidence development, with the discipline to stop somewhere down the line and say, you know what, this doesn't work, let's not do it. And maybe that's a good place for me to stop. <laughs>